So elections U.S. and U.K., primarily about the United States. It's, uh, it's, the action, it's where the action is uh, at the moment, that's for sure, with uh, New Hampshire having just been yesterday. And apologies for one of the slides because uh, uh, one of the counties hasn't uh, yet declared and it, it can't be Romney, so it must be one of the, uh, one of the also Rands who are very narrowly between getting one delegate uh, to this person or one delegate to that person uh, that they're doing a recount or something because they've only got 95% uh, uh, so far announced. What I'm going to be talking about today is public opinion generally and some of my thoughts about the role of public opinion uh, and public opinion polls, uh, one of the means by which we know about public opinion. Uh, then the American presidential election, as announced. Then the UK current political scene, and it's fast moving. In fact, uh, Romney et al. were knocked off the principal uh, news broadcasts this morning because of the announcement of the Scottish referendum date, more or less, uh, the autumn of 2014, uh, in the face of UK uh, com um, takeover of the Scottish uh, referendum, which I think is quite appropriate, uh, both legally and constitutionally, that it should be the UK. After all, you can tell by my accent, even after 42 years living in this country, that I grew up in the United States and the Civil War was fought over that very question about uh, devolution of the South. Uh, and they still sing, the South shall rise again. Uh, a brief summary, well, not so brief summary on the American side, quite a lengthy summary. <laughs> Uh, sorry, on the British side, and then time, as Chris says, for question and answer. So what is public opinion? The Oxford International uh, Unabridged Dictionary takes, I think it's uh, 3,425 or something like that, words to define public opinion. I take very, very few. Uh, what is it? It's the views of a defined population. And public opinion can be the student body at Warwick, and that can be a tricky thing because not all the students are here and you, not, you, you, you need a proper methodological sampling. It's not a catch, catch as catch can as my students at City University when I was lecturing there for 12 years in the Graduate Center of Journalism. Uh, I always use that as one of my pop quiz questions. How would you sample the student body of, the, of City University? And almost always, on those 12 years, students would say, well, you'd stand somebody out in front of the entrance to the building and you'd get every 10th person. And I would say, uh, well, actually, uh, uh, think of the graduate students you would miss who are not coming in. And what about the back entrance and the side entrances and all of that? And besides, there are people on uh, study leave or they're on uh, assignment elsewhere, or they're in the library of another university because that's where the books are that they need, so on and so forth, and get them thinking about the proper sampling that you have to do. And I'll talk about sampling in not too long because I know this is not a method methodology class, but uh, talking about uh, public opinion and then public opinion polls, I think is a, is a good preface to the thing you're really interested in, I suspect, which is the American election. Uh, so what is then a public opinion poll? Well, I define that uh, pretty simply as well as the views of, that sounds familiar, and in brackets, a representative sample of a defined population. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the sampling at City University or Warwick or Kent or LSC or any place else, but uh, you can define a population in virtually any way that you want. A population can be, a universe, as we say, can be. I was once asked, by the way, by The Guardian, when these things about uh, um, collective nouns uh, were being talked about ad nauseum, to define uh, a, uh, a collective noun for, a, uh, for pollsters. And I said, well, it's obviously a sample uh, of pollsters would be the, collect, uh, the adjective, descriptive adjective for a collective noun, uh, unless you had all of them, and then it would be a census. So a defined population could be a census, like the members of parliament. There are 650 uh, members of parliament. They are, by definition, a census of the House of Commons, unless you leave out the 
uh, Northern Irish 18 MPs, in which it, case it would be a census of British MPs as opposed to United Kingdom MPs. It can be uh, the people in Coventry, and then you would raise the question, if you were a, a good methodologist, of uh, is that uh, people who are on the electoral rolls? Because we know that not all the people are on the electoral rolls, and if you're not on the electoral rolls, how do you find them in a representative way? So uh, the views uh, describes uh, one aspect of the work that I do, and a representative sample of a defined population, the other. And I say it's a very simple business. All you have to do is ask the right sample of a defined population, the right questions, get the wording right, add up the figures correctly, and the most difficult thing to do often is get it reported knowledgeably and honestly, not by us, but by our mediators, because often public opinion polls are working with and for the media. And in this country, particularly in the United Kingdom, you have a very difficult job because of the educational system. The educational system, I said on any questions many years ago, and it was booed and hissed for it, that uh, the problem with the educational system is it graduates literate people who can't add and numerate people who can't write. And unfortunately, journalists, about 95% of them, come through the literary side. And when you ask them something to do with simple statistics, they haven't got a clue. And I've had editors say, oh, no, no, don't, don't show me the numbers. Tell me what it says or radio and television interviews, interviewers who have played that game. Now, now, what do you find important? And you know what that's saying. They haven't really looked at the numbers. Uh, I did get a, have a book review once, uh, a book called We British, that Eric Jacobs, the late Eric Jacobs on the Sunday Times and I did together and had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, President, I think he is, George Weidenfeld, gave a party for the political journalists who were streaming in uh, to the party to launch the book. And uh, the flack was uh, uh, clearly had not read the book. Uh, and she, they were saying to me as they came through the door, how come I haven't had a copy of the book? We want to uh, review it uh, and write about it. And I was saying, well, I put you on the list. So I went over to her after about the third or fourth person to say this. And she said, oh, well, I couldn't send it to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in town. And she'd sent it to literary editors, and only one of whom reviewed it. And the headline over the review, which wasn't that good, too many numbers. Well, when I do a book, I do numbers, let me tell you. So getting it reported knowledgeably and honestly is difficult. One more anecdote about that. During the last general election last year, uh, year before last now, 2010 in this country, I was asked to speak at the BBC's internal College of Journalism, which they have. And there were 41 people in the audience, and there were very high level turnout. I had two members of the five person uh, managing board of the BBC sitting there. And I used a term that I will use later in the talk about uh, swing. Now, swing is something that uh, is, is most frequently used in this country, has been for 40 or 50 years, to uh, give you a tool, very simple tool, by which you can compare different uh, sorts of uh, findings from different elections to draw comparisons and to make projections. And the paper uses swing extensively, as you will see, to describe the 2008 American election, state by state, to compare states on the same statistical basis, and demographically, and I'm going to come to that when I get to it, uh, and I will be making reference to it, and then there are several other handouts to do with the British uh, election, the last British election. Right, so understanding public opinion research, we don't measure facts. We measure people's perceptions. And now we're talking about attitudes, and I'm coming to that in a moment, or people's views as I describe them. Secondly, there are two kinds of findings we can bring to our clients, reality and misperception. And I've got uh, a word about that in a moment. 
There are five things we find with the tools of our trade. People's behavior, what they do, that's reasonably easy. Knowledge, what they know, and that's more difficult. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And three things that I call collectively views, people's views. And I use the surface of the ocean to put a, an idea in your mind. And if there's one thing I'm going to teach today that I would like everybody to walk away with thinking thoughtfully about what I'm saying is that there are three levels of people's views, all of us. First are people's opinions, lightly held, not things that they have thought about deeply or probably even at all. They didn't have a clue as to what they thought about it, their view about it until asked by a friend, neighbor, teacher, professor, uh, priest, whatever, uh, or friends and family or school chums, uh, but they just reacted to it, not having given it much thought. Those are easily changed. Information that's new to the individual can change misperceptions, particularly from a source they respect. And if you can get those two things working together in politics, then you can you can get people to change their opinions very easily. Much more difficult to change, or what I describe, are people's attitudes. The opinions are the froth on the ocean, easily blown about by the winds of the politicians, the media, and the like. Attitudes are currents below the surface that ebb and flow, but they can be changed with these two things, one or the other, or preferably both of the information, as I say, that's new to them from a source they respect. And this is very important in politics because an awful lot of people know things that just aren't so. The most difficult thing of all to change are people's values. And the values are like the deep tides below the surface, enormously powerful. Things like belief in God, the death penalty, euthanasia, abortion. For 25% of the British people, 25%, one person in four, would not cause a mouse severe pain or death to help find a cure for leukemia in children. Now, that belief, that view, that value says a lot when you think about banning fox hunting. And people are surprised in this country that so many people are in favor of banning fox hunting. But when you start with a, a value, core value, of 25%, it's not very difficult to get to 51% or a majority compared to people who are thinking about fox hunting as a sport or whatever and are not concerned with animal rights. And it explains a lot. Now, I've never tested it in a different country, but I suspect in my native country of the United States, uh, it wouldn't be anything like 25%. But it's instilled as a core value among the British. Hands up those of you who have never been polled and don't know anybody who's ever been polled. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, those of you who have been polled, put up your hands. Now keep them up. Now will the rest of you look around and you'll never again be able to say you've never been polled and you don't know anybody's ever been polled, right? Gotcha. Okay, the purpose of that was to bring to your, to your uh, awareness that that second thing, behavior and then knowledge, it was something that you thought was true. It was not true. It was a misperception. And I've just proved it's a misperception because you do know these people. Look around you. There they are. And they have been polled. But it's a common cliche that I've never been polled and I don't know anybody's ever been polled. And I was at a luncheon once with a local member of parliament and his wife and uh, the 
regional woman's chairman was sitting on my right, and she said, I don't, I've never been polled, and I don't, I've never, I don't know anybody who's ever been polled. And the chap sitting at the end of the table, and I think there were eight of us at the table, had a wee smile on his face. And I said, what are you smiling about? Because I thought, I thought this is going to be helpful. He said, you know, I used to say that. And two months ago, maybe three months ago, I live at the end of a long drive. And an interviewer came down the drive and knocked on the door. Not only that, but she was from Maury, my firm. And she was doing a survey for Kent County Council. And he was a Kent County Council counselor. And when she asked the question, who is your local counselor? You know, she was just stunned to find that I was it. And uh, that was just a, a helpful thing to get my idea to use the hands up uh, in lectures, which I've been doing all these years. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks. We look at 2008, uh, John McCain, and we look at 2012, Mitt Romney, and I put that on there last night before the result and left these the same because it's the same guy and I think if there's anybody in this room who doesn't recognize that picture I would not need to label it or you shouldn't be here. Okay, uh, by the way, another hands up. Who isn't interested in the American election? Not a hand. This is the 46th lecture or speech or talk that I have given and ask that question in this country over the last four or five years, and I have yet to have a single person from schools, sixth form, uh, to uh, graduate students, I have yet to have anyone, and not just always on American elections, uh, uh, to, to put up their hand that they weren't, in, they weren't interested in last time's American election or this time's American election, 46 times. Now, the battleground states in 2004, I put up to show you as a contrast to what it was last time, because there were really only three, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida. And if a candidate won one of those states, he'd lost the election. If he won two of those states, he'd won the election. And that got us into the hanging chads in Florida that went to the Supreme Court, never should have, and they shouldn't have, they shouldn't have ever taken it in the first place. And the election commissioner was the chairman of the Republican Party in Florida, and there, you know, we could talk all night about all of that. But nonetheless, uh, there it was, and uh, the Bush lead was 4%, and that put George W. Bush, Bush 43, into the White House. There were 270 electoral votes to win, and two of those states put it over, 270, and when Florida went to Bush, that was that. 51% to 47%. Now, uh, you do not have this handout, and I'm not going to try and uh, go through it with you, but I wanted to make the point, and I make it three times, uh, that opinion polls properly sampled with a reasonable size sample, and not, Americans don't always use reasonably sized samples for voting intention, but we do in this country because we have a, an unwritten rule that if somebody wants us to do a poll with less than a thousand people, we say no thank you. And so the pollsters just have this self-serving uh, uh, ordinance so that the media don't screw us down to these tiny samples that sometimes is the case in the United States. I wanted to get that point in. But uh, statistical uh, uh, mathematics will prove that a properly representative sample of a thousand people, uh, that is a very, very well done sample, will 95 times in 100, uh, called two sigma, uh, produce accuracy 95, uh, sorry, 95 times in 100 uh, at uh, around 50%. So 17 of the 17 polls that are on here uh, had 51%, 48% for Bush and Kerry, this two-horse race thing here, within 3%, 100%. 
65 percent, 11 out of 17, 11 out of 15, if you leave out these two guys, these two gray guys, I'll get to that. Uh, so 11 out of 17 or 65 percent with them, 73 percent without them, had it within 2 percent, 4 out of 17, 24 percent, uh, 27 percent, had them within one point. These are the final polls by this, by this group of polling organizations. Uh, and if you look at these scores, 52, 48, what you've got is an accuracy, a uh, lead error actually of a six-tenths of a percent. And you go down. So on the eve of the election, because people do change their minds, and I'll certainly prove that on the UK side of things, uh, on the eve of the election, all of those polls, except the two that were done by internet, Harris and YouGov, in 2004. So all of them were very good, except the two, and even they were pretty good. Now, there were six reasons why I said in 2008 that McCain would lose. And I said it at Tunbridge School, and I'd forgotten that until I prepared this lecture on the 15th of January in 2008. And here we are on the 11th of January, and I'm going to do the same thing with uh, the 2012 American election. The first was, it was time for a change, and a change from George W. Bush. He was age 72, not in the best of health. Therefore, I pointed out that his most important decision is his vice presidential nomination. I had no idea, nor did anybody else. <laughs> he had a short fuse, and I said, sooner or later, somebody was going to light it. Actually, he didn't. Uh, suspicion from the right of the Republican Party, doesn't that sound familiar? And Cindy versus Michelle, and there was no contest as to who was going to be the best, the best uh, supporter there. So those were the six reasons I said 11 months before the election that McCain would lose. So where the race was at the end of October in 2008, we had to look not only at Ohio, but at Florida, Virginia, Indiana, Missouri, Colorado, New Mexico, and Nevada. They were all, all the target states. A much more complex uh, job to be done. Obama had a lead at that time of eight. These were the scores in the individual. Now, Missouri was a very interesting state. It was the most marginal state four years ago. Obama's clever advisors and decision to not take the hundred million or whatever it was that was on offer from the Federal Electoral Commission raised by people's taxes, including my own with, I think, three dollars ticked uh, that you get to take off your, your taxes if uh, to take off your income that you report. Not much, but it adds up to a lot with millions and millions of people filing their taxes. But Obama chose not to, so he could use the internet particularly well, as well as some big donors, to gather even more money and was able to staff 84 local offices in the state of Missouri, the most marginal state, compared to 14 for McCain. Now, I thought that was a very smart move and a very good move because it brought the election more down to the people than normally is the case where you have uh, so much of elections uh, on television, particularly in the United States. It's television and radio to some degree in this country. And uh, McCain won by a very, very narrow margin, but it would have been three points, four points, five points without that work on the ground. Ohio, going ahead, and Indiana, for some reason, uh, went for, uh, well, many reasons, went for uh, Obama's opponent, uh, McCain. So what you had was McCain, McCain and Palin, and the handout 
takes you through, if you'll take the handout and look on page two, tell me which state had the biggest swing to Obama of any state in the union between John Kerry and Barack Obama. Hawaii. Why Hawaii? Okay, that's one reason. Got another one? What? Come on. Well, I would think so, but uh, I'm not sure that the right-wing Republicans would. No, 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 somebody already said that. It's a multiracial state. So he was getting support uh, for both those reasons, and it was a huge swing in a normally uh, well, it's a normal, de normally a democratic place anyway. However, uh, this, was, this was a big swing. But I've got a better surprise for you on the next page, which is how you look at uh, swing by demographics. And this one I was absolutely stunned by, but it explains to some degree the headline of the paper explaining where and by whom a black liberal intellectual was elected to be the U.S. president. I couldn't think of three more dangerous words for a politician to be described as in the United States before Barack Obama as being black, being a liberal, and being an intellectual. All three, you would, any one of the three would do him in, but it didn't. So. Where was the biggest swing, which also happened to be the biggest increase in turnout of any demographic group? Can you find it? Youth. Youth? Wrong. Wealthy people. Wealthy people. Isn't that stunning? You would have thought when Obama pledged to raise the taxes of 85% of the American public, it, were, it was families who made over $200,000 a year who went from 3% of the electorate, of the voters, to 6% of the voters, and had the biggest swing to Barack Obama. The votes. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, that's how you use swing. I thought a good example, a peer-reviewed paper, and uh, uh, one that I'm very proud of, obviously, because it did an analysis, and I'm gonna do the same thing again as quickly as I can after the next election. And if you're still here, I'll come back and tell you about it. Okay, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're not gonna get to the UK, I can tell you that. So, final po no, final polls, previous. Uh, final polls, same kind of a story. You got uh, 19 out of 19 were within 3% uh, because these guys got their act together, the, the internet people. The internet people are YouGov, Polymetrics, and Harris. Harris, so that they were seventh best and twelfth best, but there's not a lot in it when it's that close anyway. They all, they're all did a pretty good job. And you hear, you know, the politicians are always saying, oh, you can't believe the polls. Oh, the only poll that counts is the poll on election, is the, what the people do on election day, so on and so forth. That's when they're behind, of course. Uh, <laughs> there you are. Uh, we had, uh, 53, 46, 18 out of the 19 were within two points, and 11 out of the 19, or 58%, were within one percentage point of. Now, it's not the case that polls, I remember when um, I was working with Mr. Callahan when he was prime minister in this country, and he said, but you told us we were gonna lose in Grimsby. I said, prime minister, I did that poll in January. The election was in, I think, May. Uh, the by-election was in May. You hadn't even chosen your candidate. I didn't tell you you were going to lose Granby. Uh, uh, Grant, not, what? Grimsby. 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 Uh, I didn't tell you you were going to lose Grimsby. Uh, I said that if you'd hold, held the poll today, in January, you would be losing Grimsby. I didn't know that Austin Mitchell, who was the candidate that was selected about a month later, was a student at Nuffield when he was at university. And he looked at the poll, he, I didn't know him then, I know him extremely well now and have for the last 25 years because he's been a member of parliament for Grimsby all that time. Uh, but he said he took one look at that set of findings 
which were delivered to him the night that he was selected as the candidate, and he said, I can win this election, and of course he did. Okay, I uh, won't go through all that. It's, uh, it's effectively what uh, you've got in that paper, Battleground State. So let's move forward to 2012. Chronology of the 2012 election. Well, end of September, Romney was ahead, 23 to 20. There was Perry. You remember Perry? Nobody else does. Uh, Kane, you remember Kane? He had 14%. Gingrich has, had nine, still has nine. Uh, but that wasn't the way it was. Then you had Kane up there at the end of October, 25%. Romney, look at the static position that Romney's in. Gingrich has gone up a point or two. Perry has dropped in half. Just like that. In November, first debate, uh, uh, sorry, not, yeah, the first debate, uh, three states had had prior debates, but this was the first national really at capturing the attention of people. And at the end of November, Gingrich had gone shooting up from 9% up to 33%. Why? They wanted somebody to beat Romney. He's everybody's target. Everybody, right, left, and center. Kane uh, had been 25%. He's dropped in half. Paul, he's got into double figures for the first time at the end of November. End of December, here's Gingrich dropping by five. Romney still static, 24%. Paul has come up a little bit, and this guy Santorum is, doesn't have, uh, Perry's dropped to seven, and Perry was at 20, so he's gone beyond dropping in half, uh, and Santorum has surfaced for the first time. In January, Romney won the Iowa caucus by just eight votes, and Santorum was a close second, and Santorum was the new guy for a week. And then there was the New Hampshire primary. And then in 21st, there's going to be the South Carolina primary. And then on the 30th, the Florida primary. And by February 28th, literally, there's going to be a lacuna of a month. But that month is going to be intensely political because all the action's going to be in those four states. There are a couple of caucus states, but we're not going to be paying a lot of attention to those. There's a thing called Super Tuesday that comes in uh, early in March. Did last time, did the time before, and it was, I think, the 6th of March, I haven't checked it, that actually uh, McCain got the Republican nomination locked up because he had enough delegate votes collected and in those days, the Republicans had a first-past-the-post winner-take-all way of counting. Now the Republicans have changed their voting uh, counting so that Vermont, which has 12, uh, 12 uh, delegates to the convention, gave eight to Romney, three, I think, to Gingrich, uh, and whatever it was. But you got these eight states, by that time, I don't think many people are gonna even notice. Republican National Convention is not until August, the end of August, when they actually anoint their candidate. Democrats a week later, it's reversed from four years ago, as they tend to do. Then you've got the national presidential debate, the vice, one vice presidential debate as before, the second, and then election day, and there is my uh, <laughs> bet, and I will take your money if you'd like to uh, <laughs> test me. There are six reasons. The election of a Republican Congress in 2010. I thought the British press made hash of that. It was all about, oh, big, big disappointment for Obama that he didn't carry Congress. I said on radio, I wasn't asked to be on television the next day, uh, but on radio, I said, it's the best thing that could happen to Obama. Why? Because he had somebody to blame. If you had a Republican Senate, a Republican Congress, and a Republican White House, sorry, a Democratic Senate, Democratic Congress, and Democratic White House, who was going to carry the can for the state of the economy? The president. Now, he's got somebody to blame. I think this is a big reason, and I've been saying so for three months, 
uh, six months, that uh, that is the case. The economy is improving. Actually, people are doing better now and recognize that they're doing better. There has been, I can't remember how many weeks, 15 weeks or something like that, of increased uh, jobs in the United States. And unlike Europe, it's going to be a pretty good uh, 2012, I suspect, not by normal standards, but by the standards of the basket case that Europe's going to be in. Uh, so it will, there'll be a feel good factor. The Republicans are without doubt a divided party. They are all over the place. And the idea that some of these candidates are even, even have the gall to be in the race is ridiculous. Of course, I thought that about Mitt Romney four years ago. There'll be a right-wing Republicans who'll stay home. A lot of them will go out and vote holding their nose for any candidate, Romney, just to beat Obama, but there will be some who can't stomach it. Barack Obama's a formidable campaigner. He's probably a better campaigner than he is president. And so's Michelle. So those are the six reasons, and I've said it here, and this is the first lecture I've given after these two elections, and so you're the first to hear it, and that will be on this slide for the rest of this year, and, and in four years' time. Okay, now polling uh, post-Iowa. Uh, it's too, too soon to have any polls from uh, yesterday's results, because we still haven't got the totals, uh, but hopefully we will have by the end of the day. So you got Romney by 10. Uh, as an average, uh, Reuters, Ipsos, uh, my own company uh, in the United States with a ridiculously small sample, had almost exactly the same figure as Gallup with 1,414. I'm going to really tick them off for going out with that, but Reuters are mean, uh, mean clients. Uh, you got 12 there. Uh, CBS News, again with too small a sample, 440 against 414, so, you know, uh, neither here nor there. But if you've got 11, 12, 10, and 10, you've got a pretty good idea who the outlier is. Now, I warn people, don't focus on the lead, which I've just done. Focus on the share. So you've got 27, 30, 30, 27, 29. It's pretty clear that CBS News has not really got their act together on that particular survey. It's too small a sample. This is closer for Gingrich. This is closer, 21's a bit high in Rasmussen. Uh, Paul, pretty, pretty good scores. That's good and that's good. This is a bell curve kind of a thing. When you get down to the wings of the bell curve, you can actually be more accurate, statistically speaking, with tiny numbers than you can in the center because as you should know, the bell curve is shaped like that and there's uh, more chance that you'll have dispersion at the top of the curve. Election results to date, comparing the polls in Iowa, they say that Iowa's more difficult because you don't know who's going to actually show up on the day of the caucus. And uh, my son Lawrence here, uh, who happens to be in the country and so for some reason said, can we come to your lecture? Uh, he, he's been lectured all his life. I don't know why, why he's here, but uh, he, he's here and he taught me that there's a caucus, you said caucus effect, uh, the, the phrase being caucus effect, because of course these caucuses have done away with the secret ballot. You've got this room full of people, friends and neighbors, and uh, as he put it to me the other day, he said, uh, um, you stand up and you say, well, I'm for uh, uh, Perry, uh, because he's a good Christian, and if you're a good Christian, you ought to be here over here with me. And you've been going to church with this guy for the last 25 years, and you think, well, God, I better go over there and, you know, sit here and pretend I'm going to be for Perry, but I really like uh, Bachman or whatever, uh, and that effect. Now, I think that's a pernicious effect, and there are lots and lots of states, Missouri and Kansas for two, that... Uh, uh, are having caucuses this year to choose their delegates. They're a lot cheaper than having primaries. 
And I think that's the principal reason why, and I do not think it is a good thing for democracy. Uh, the, I just put a health warning on this, and when I redo the paper, I will send you up a copy of it, uh, I mean the, the slides, uh, when we've got the extra 5% so these things are more accurate. But you can see with exception of Santorum, who was the surprise in this one, there's always a surprise. The surprise last time was Barack Obama won it. There has not been a Republican candidate who has won both Iowa and uh, New Hampshire, the caucus and the primary since 1976. It's been that long ago that uh, that's been the case. Uh, here's the matchups. And this is interesting. And this was, I think, as much as anything driving you know, I really worry about the responsibility that pollsters have, but I know most of them in most countries, most of the big guys anyway. Uh, Chris was kind enough to say that we're large. Actually, it hasn't been yet announced, but Ipsos Mori is now the largest re research firm in Great Britain, and or the Ipsos Group, which I sold Mori to five years ago, is now the second largest in the world. So we're a really big, I, I had a, uh, email yesterday from, in, from a guy I know in India who I have a high risk regard for, wanting to know if we, there was some way we can work together. I didn't even know who we had in India because we've just done a big merger. Or we're in the midst of a big merger with another big, uh, fifth and sixth largest. Uh, we're the, Ipsos was the fifth largest. Uh, the other company was sixth, and so together we're the second largest in the world. But you see Gingrich is eight points behind and I'm sure that hurt him for those people who are paying attention to this kind of thing. Uh, Santorum, who was never going to get it anyway, and Paul, who was never going to get it anyway. Actually, Paul does very well there. People like libertarians, I guess, I'm glad to say. Perry, of course, is way out of it and has dropped, and Huntsman is hoping that he'll be able to work in the next administration, whichever party it is, and he's already made a pitch for that. Uh, Elections on the UK. Do I want to say anything? No. Let's, let's just talk about the American elections because I've gone 45 minutes and uh, uh, I'll leave that for another time.